Hey guys, thanks for checking out this week's message. At Hope City, we're always so encouraged to hear how God is bringing the hope of Jesus to people through this ministry. If God has used this ministry to bring hope to your life, we'd love to hear about it. To share your story, you can email us at lifechange at hopecityonline.net. Also, if you'd like to support this ministry financially, you can simply text any amount to the number on the screen. It's a safe and secure way to support the work God is doing here at Hope City. Now, let's prepare our hearts for a message of God's Word. As most of you know, over the last several months, we've been in a series of teachings and conversations that we've called the Upside Down Kingdom. The reason why we've called this the Upside Down Kingdom is because we've been working our way through Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7. It's a New Testament gospel, according to the writer Matthew, where he walks through and unpacks for us one of the most profound and prolific sermons that Jesus ever preached, one that we've affectionately titled the Sermon on the Mount. And in this sermon, Jesus lays the groundwork and the foundation for what it looks like to live in this kingdom that he established. But it's so different and so counterintuitive to how we would ever consider the understanding of a kingdom here on this earth that it's best to be known as the upside down kingdom where it's not about amassing land and wealth and keeping it all for ourselves. It's about tearing down walls and inviting people in. It's not about what we gain. It's about what we give consistently over and over again. There's this upside down tendency to the things that Jesus teaches. And last week, there was a portion and passage of scripture that I spent some time unpacking where Jesus says, you've heard that it was said to love your neighbor, but I tell you, love your enemies. And most people assume that Jesus was unpacking or unveiling something new when in reality he was helping us to understand that those who we've classified as our enemies he classifies as his children as his creation and those we've labeled as our enemies are actually our brothers and our sisters those that we say are different than us ideologically philosophically politically those who we don't agree with those that we don't like those that we've labeled as an enemy they're actually our neighbor God says to love your neighbor as yourself. As members of this kingdom, as members of this upside down citizenship, we're called to bring love and mercy and grace to those that society has labeled the untouchables. There's a portion of scripture that I read last week that I want to take a moment and reiterate, and I'm going to go ahead and warn you now, this morning is going to look significantly different than any other morning here at Hope City. If you're a guest with us or you haven't been here in a while, I want you to know that what we're about to do and embark on is not something that is normal around here, but I think that it's necessary and that it's timely. A portion of scripture that I read last week that I want to reiterate and, and give a little bit more credence and time and energy to is found towards the end of Matthew chapter 5. Where Jesus says these words, these aren't going to be on the screen or anything, I just want to read them to you. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Eugene Peterson wrote a paraphrased translation of the scriptures known as the message. And in the message translation, it's worded this way. This is what God does. He gives his best, the sun to warm and the rain to nourish, to everyone, regardless, the good and the bad, the nice and the nasty. So if all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you first, you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. In a word, what I'm saying is this. Grow up your kingdom subjects. Now live like it. 
Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward everyone the way that God lives towards you. Right now, there is a dialogue and a discussion taking place in our nation that I think is a timely dialogue for the body of Christ to not only tune into, but to have a voice in. Because there are people in our society that have been labeled enemies. There are people in our society who've been labeled untouchables. There are people in our society who've been labeled broken and God has called his kingdom subjects to go and show grace and mercy and compassion and love to those people, the ones that society has placed labels on. But I think the question that we fail to answer and where we often fall short in the body of Christ is the question of how. Like, like tangibly, physically, how? How do you do that? Do you go down one Saturday and serve at a, at a food pantry? Do you go find somebody who doesn't look like you and try to have a conversation with them to understand where they're coming from? Like, like how do you do this? How do you live out the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount? Well, several weeks ago, I had the privilege of attending a simulcast of the Global Leadership Summit. It's a gathering of leaders from all over the world to hear some of the leading edge leaders in our culture from around the globe. One of the talks that I heard was from a guy who's not a pastor, he's not a preacher, he's not a member of the clergy at all. In fact, he is a lawyer. He's a criminal defense attorney by the name of Brian Stevenson. He serves with and works on behalf of those who don't feel like they've got a fair shake in our society. When I heard him give this talk, it was the most convicting, empowering, and emboldening conversations that I'd ever heard. And knowing that we were coming up on this portion of Scripture in the Sermon on the Mount, I said, I want our church to hear from this guy. I want them to hear this talk. Now, unfortunately, the Global Leadership Summit didn't make that particular talk available to the public. So the talk that I heard, I couldn't bring you. But something that he said in the talk was interesting, and so I went hunting. He said, I give this exact same talk whether I'm speaking in front of believers in a church or lawyers in a college or the general public because he gives four principles and four ways that he wants to help people begin to live out these teachings and the only one that I could find that was as similar to the one that I originally heard was one where he was talking to um, a room full of lawyers fellow lawyers And so I brought that talk with me today, and I want us to take some time and energy and attention and focus it onto the screens and listen to the words that this guy has to say. And I want you to do me a favor, indulge me just a little bit. Recognizing that he's not speaking to a church, he's speaking to a group of lawyers. Every time he says rule of law, I want you to replace it with kingdom of God. Because the principles he talks about are just as, if not more, applicable. And every time he says lawyer, I want you to replace it in your mind with believer. You think you can do that? It's It's a big ask, I know. Every time he says rule of law, think kingdom of God. And every time he says lawyer, think believer. And I know that's difficult for some of you because like, there could not be two more polar opposite than a Christian and a lawyer in your mind. So you're struggling with that right now. But just hang with me for a second. Because I promise you, God wants to teach you. God wants to show you. God wants to challenge you this morning. And even if he says some things that challenge your ideologies, even if he says some things which challenge you politically, even if he says some things which challenge you culturally, if you're from the deep south, I want you to at least be willing to be open to what it is God may be wanting to say to you today. Because some of the things that he expresses in this talk give us a clear recipe, a clear roadmap for living out the teachings found in the Sermon on the Mount. So turn your attention to the screens as we hear from Brian Stevenson.
Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you so much. It's such an honor uh, for me to be back uh, here at the college. It's great to be on uh, the podium uh, with two of my heroes, uh, two extraordinary criminal defense attorneys who I regard as some of the best criminal defense attorneys this nation has ever seen, one being Michelle Roberts and the other being Judy Clark, who I've had the privilege to see in court. It's also great to be back here because in 2004 you did something really extraordinary uh, for me by awarding me uh, this award. Uh, uh, the justice mentioned that I grew up in a home dominated by my grandmother who was the architect uh, of everything that happened in our lives. She was a traditional African-American matriarch. My grandmother was tough and strong. Uh, she was the end of every argument in our family. Uh, she was also the start of a lot of arguments in our family. <laughs> Uh, but my grandmother had these qualities that just never left you. And when I was a little boy, she'd come up to me and she'd give me these hugs. And she'd squeeze me so tightly, you could barely breathe. You thought she was trying to hurt you. And then she'd see you an hour later and she'd say, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? And if I said no, she would jump on me again. <laughs> and by the time I'd gotten to be nine or 10, she had taught me and all of her other grandchildren, as soon as we would see our grandmother, the first thing we would say is, Mama, I always feel you hugging me and she would let us be, but that was something that she did. And when my grandmother was in her 90s, and she was still working as a domestic worker, and she'd fallen on a bus, and she had developed a hip injury and cancer, and we knew she was in her last days. I went to see her, and I never will forget being there, just being disappointed because her eyes were closed. I didn't think she could hear what I was saying to her, and I was sitting with her and holding her hand, and I said my final goodbyes, and my grandmother squeezed my hand, and she said, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? And there have been times in my career where I have felt her hugging me. And when we as communities create identities like this community has, and we wrap our arms around people like Judy Clark, we wrap our arms around people who are trying to fight the good fight, when we wrap our arms around people who have been excluded and marginalized, people whose rights are being questioned and threatened, I think we do the thing that justice requires. That's when I think we create an identity for the legal profession and for law professionals that can inspire our country, our civilization, to do what's right even when it's hard. And there are challenges that we're facing that I think we have to wrap our arms around people to confront. I'm very worried about what's happened in this country, the United States. We had 300,000 people in jails and prisons in 1972. Today we have 2.3 million people in jails and prisons. The United States has become the most punitive country in the world. We've got six million people on probation or parole. There are 70 million Americans with criminal arrests, which means that when they sometimes try for loans or try to get jobs, they are disfavored because of that criminal arrest history. We've done terrible things to women in the last 20 years. The percentage of women going to prison has increased 646% in the last 20 years. 70% of the women that we send to jails or prisons are single parents with minor children, which means that when these women go to jails or prisons, their children get displaced. We do terrible things to people coming out of prison. Uh, the president came to my state of Alabama in 19, uh, 2015 to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March. 80,000 people came, members of Congress came. They marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge knowing that that historic march led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, but very few of them realized that today in the state of Alabama, 30% of the black male population has permanently lost the right to vote as a result of a criminal conviction. The statistic that keeps me up latest at night is the one from the Bureau of Justice. The Bureau of Justice now predicts that one in three black male babies born in this country is expected to go to jail or prison during his lifetime. One in three. That wasn't true in the 20th century. That wasn't true in the 19th century. That's become true in the 21st century. The statistic for Latino boys is one in six. So what I want to talk today about is this need uh, to create a larger, louder voice for justice for fairness. And I have a recipe. I don't want to just talk about the problems. I could do that all morning long, but I have a recipe. I believe that we have the kind of identity in our community, in the legal profession, that we can actually make even more movement toward justice across the world. But there are four things we have to do. The first thing I'm persuaded that we have to do in our individual capacity as lawyers or professionals or people, it doesn't even require a law degree, 
I believe the first thing we have to do is we've got to get closer to people whose rights are being violated. We've got to get closer to people who are being excluded and marginalized, who are being oppressed by systems that, that don't recognize their humanity and decency. And I say that because I believe there's power in proximity. The best lawyers know their cases inside and out. The best lawyers know the courtroom. They know what they're dealing with. They take care to select a jury with whom they can get close. They understand that winning happens when you are proximate, close to the decision makers. That proximity is key to being effective. And we've got a lot of policymakers in our nation trying to solve problems from a distance, they're trying to describe and prescribe solutions from a distance, and they haven't gotten close enough to hear the nuances and the details of the problems. And I believe that they're not going to work. We've got to get closer. Most of us have been taught our whole lives if there's a part of town where the schools don't function very well, where there's a lot of violence or abuse or neglect or despair, most of us have been taught to stay as far away from those parts of town as possible. I actually believe that we need to get closer to the people in our communities that are living in the margins, that are excluded. We've got to get closer to people in jails and prisons, closer to people coming out of jails and prisons. And I am persuaded that when we get proximate, we will find the power to articulate why the rule of law is so key, why justice is so important, why mercy can be so powerful. It's in proximity that we find our strength, our voice, our courage. I've gotten close to children prosecuted as adults. It's one of the great challenges, heartbreaking challenges that I've seen. We had people going around 30 years ago arguing that some children aren't children. And these criminologists persuaded our policymakers that there were some kids who looked like kids and sound like kids. They said, but they're not kids. Uh, these criminologists came up with a new word. They said, these children are, quote, super predators. That's the word they used, and they demonized a generation of children, mostly black and brown kids, and every state in the country lowered the minimum age for trying children as adults. You're sitting in a state, the state of Florida, that has no minimum age for trying children as adults in this state. I have represented nine and 10-year-old kids in this state facing 60 and 70-year sentences. There are 13-year-olds in Florida who've been condemned to life imprisonment without parole for non-homicides in this epidemic persecution and prosecution of children broke out all over the country. We created a pipeline from schools to jails. We started putting five and six-year-old children in handcuffs. We did destructive and terrible things. I represented a 14-year-old boy some years ago who lived in a household where his mother was repeatedly subject to a lot of domestic violence. This boy's mother had a boyfriend. And when the man would start drinking, he'd get violent. And one day, the man had been drinking. And he came home, and he walked into the kitchen and he called the boy's mother in the kitchen. He didn't ask her anything. He just walked up to this boy's mother and he punched her in the face. She fell and she hit her head as she fell. She was on the floor bleeding. Her son came running into the, uh, to the kitchen to help his mom. He tried to stop the bleeding. He tried to get her to respond, to revive, and he couldn't. And after 10 minutes, this child thought his mom was dead. She wasn't dead, but he thought she was dead. So the little boy got up and he went into the bedroom where the man was sleeping. He was snoring. And the boy was going to call the police or the ambulance, but then he remembered that this man kept a handgun in his dresser drawer. And he walked over to the dresser drawer and he pulled out the gun. And then he walked over to where the man was sleeping and he pointed the gun at the man's head. The man was snoring, he stopped snoring, and when the man stopped snoring, the little boy panicked. And tragically, he pulled the trigger and shot the man in the head, killed him instantly. This little boy was very small for his age. He was under five feet tall. He weighed less than 100 pounds. He'd never been in trouble before. No prior juvenile adjudications. He was the kind of kid that might have been tried as a juvenile, but for the fact that the man that he shot and killed, his mother's boyfriend, well, that man was a deputy sheriff. And because he was a deputy sheriff, the prosecutor insisted that this child be tried as an adult. And the judge certified him to stand trial as an adult. They placed him in the adult jail. He'd been there three days before his grandmother got me involved in the case. And I went to the jail to see this little boy. And when he walked in, I was just brokenhearted by how small and terrified he looked. He sat down. I started asking him questions. But no matter what I asked him, he wouldn't say anything. He just sat there. I finally put my pen down. I said, look, I can't help you if you don't talk to me. You've got to talk to me. The little boy wouldn't say anything. I got up, I walked around the table, I pulled my chair close to him, I said, come on, you got to talk to me. I can't help you if you don't talk to me. He still wouldn't say anything. He kept staring at the wall. And I was sitting there trying to figure out what to do, and at some point, I just leaned on him. I don't even know why, but I leaned on him. 
And when I leaned on him, he leaned back. And when he leaned back, I put my arm around him and I said, come on, you gotta talk to me. I can't help you if you don't talk to me. And that's when this little boy started to cry. And through his tears, he began talking to me, not about what happened with his mom, not about what happened with the man, but he started talking to me about what had happened at the jail. He told me on the first night, several men had hurt him. He told me on the next night, uh, several people had raped him. He told me on the night before I'd gotten there, so many people had hurt him, he couldn't remember how many there had been. And I held this little boy for almost an hour while he cried hysterically. I never will forget saying to him, you stay right here, I'm gonna get you out of here, you stay right here. And I tried to leave that jail, and I'll never forget that little boy grabbing me by the arm, saying, please, please don't go, please, please don't go. I said, no, it's okay, it's all right, I'm gonna get you out of here. And then I left that jail, and the question I had in my mind was, who is responsible for this? And the answer is, we are. We are. We've allowed these narratives to evolve and to be applied to children. We've allowed our country to actually demonize children. We've gotten distant from the most tragic and vulnerable and abused children in our society. And we've got to get closer if we really want to protect our future. I believe all children are children. And it's the kids that are actually struggling, the kids that are dealing with violence and abuse, the kids that are born into violent families, living in violent neighborhoods, going to violent schools, the kids with trauma disorders, the kids that feel like their only recourse is to join a gang. It's the kids whose lives are oppressed by drug addiction and violence that are the true objects of our call to justice. I don't think we are a great society by the way we treat privileged children and gifted children. I think we become a great society by the way we respond to needy children, vulnerable children, poor children. And proximity will do some things. It made me understand that we've got to change the laws. That's why we've been to the United States Supreme Court, arguing for an end to life without parole for children, arguing for reforms. There are 10,000 children in adult jails and prisons today, and I believe if we get close to them, we will find an end to end that. But proximity won't be enough. The second thing I'm persuaded we have to do is we've got to change some of the narratives that bar us from doing justice that block us from achieving the rule of law. And I've seen this happen. We have mass incarceration in America because we made some policy choices. We decided to deal with drug addiction and drug dependency as a crime issue. We said those people are criminals. Now we could have said that that's a health issue. I think we should have said that that's a health issue. You've got countries around the world that recognize that addiction and dependency is a health problem. But we didn't do that. We said it's a crime problem and now we've put hundreds of thousands of people in jails and prisons because of their dependency. Now, with alcoholism, we said that's a health problem, that's a disease. And we have an understanding that if we see someone going into a bar who's an alcoholic, we know that we're not supposed to call the police. But we didn't do that for drug addiction, and the reason why we didn't do that is I, because, I believe because we were being led by a political mindset that was rooted in what I call the politics of fear and anger. And when we allow ourselves to be governed by fear and anger, we will actually tolerate injustice, we'll tolerate inequality. If you go anywhere in the world and you see a breakdown in the rule of law, if you see oppression and abuse, if you ask the oppressors to justify what they are doing, they'll give you a narrative of fear and anger. I believe that the rule of law stands to resist, to fight, to block the power that can be unleashed when we are governed by fear and anger. And we've got to change these narratives of fear and anger. We've got to stand up for courage and reason. That's what's at the heart of the rule of law. Changing narratives is hard, but I think it's essential. If we're going to have a recipe that really moves us toward justice, I think we have to change the narrative about race in America. Because I'm not persuaded we're yet free. I think we're burdened by a history of racial inequality that has hovers in the, in the atmosphere like smog. I think what we've done in this country over the centuries has created real injuries and we haven't treated those injuries and I think we've got to change the narrative of racial difference that still shapes our lives. And the way we do that is talking about things that we haven't talked about. You see, I think we have to talk about the fact that we are living in a post-genocide society. Both in this country and in Canada, there were native people here before white settlers came. And millions of them were killed through famine and war and disease. And we didn't really acknowledge that the way we should have. We didn't say that that was a genocide. We said, no, those people are different. We said, they're savages. And we used this narrative of racial difference to legitimate that violence. It's that same narrative that I believe sustained centuries of slavery. 
I don't think the great evil of American slavery was involuntary servitude or forced labor. I believe the great evil of American slavery was the narrative of racial difference that we created to legitimate enslavement. Uh, we wanted to feel moral and just and Christian while we owned other people, so we made up this narrative. We said, oh, black people are different than white people. They can't do this, they can't do that. They're not fully human, they're not evolved, they're not this, and this ideology of white supremacy, that was the true evil of American slavery. And if you read the 13th Amendment, it only talks about involuntary servitude and forced labor. It doesn't talk about the narrative of racial difference. And because of that, I don't think slavery ended in 1865. I think it just evolved. There were decades of lynching and terror and violence that followed emancipation. Throughout many parts of this country, black people were pulled out of their homes. They were burned alive. They were hung. They were menaced. They were beaten. They were brutalized. Older people of color come up to me sometimes. They say, Mr. Stevenson, I get angry when I hear people on TV talking about how we're dealing with domestic terrorism for the first time in our nation's history after 9-11. They say we grew up with terrorism. We had to worry about being bombed and lynched and menaced every day of our lives. The demographic geography of this nation was shaped by terror lynchings. The black people in Cleveland and Chicago and Detroit in Minneapolis and Boston and Los Angeles and Oakland did not go to those communities as immigrants looking for new economic opportunities, they went to those communities as refugees and exiles from terror in the American South. And if you know anything about a refugee community, you know you have to deal with that trauma, which we didn't do. And then we moved into the era of segregation and civil rights, and it's great that we honor the leaders of the civil rights movement, but I worry we've gotten too celebratory when we talk about that period of American history. I hear people talking about the civil rights movement, and sometimes it starts to sound like a three-day carnival. On day one, Rosa Parks didn't give up her seat on a bus. On day two, Dr. King led a march on Washington. On day three, we changed all the laws. And racial bias was over, and it would be great if that's our history, but that's not our history. I can tell you as a child who started his education in a colored school, I can tell you as a child of people who had to see those signs, white and colored, there were injuries done during this period. We said to black kids, you can't go to school because you're black. We said to black people, you can't vote because you're black. Those signs weren't directions, they were assaults, and they created wounds, and we haven't treated those wounds. We should have committed ourselves to a process of truth and reconciliation, but we didn't do it. And today, we're still living at a time where there's a presumption of dangerousness and guilt that gets assigned, assigned to people of color. And as I get older, I will tell you, having to carry this presumption, navigate my way around it, is starting to be overwhelming. You get tired. I was in a courtroom not too long ago sitting at defense counsel's table. It was my first time in the courtroom in the Midwest. And I had my suit and tie on. I was there at counsel early, counsel's table early, and the judge walked in, and he said, hey, 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 you get back out there in the hallway, and you wait until your lawyer gets here. I don't want any defendant sitting in my courtroom alone. And I stood up, and I said, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I didn't, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Brian Stevenson. I am the lawyer. And the judge started to laugh, and the prosecutor started to laugh, and I made myself laugh because they didn't want to disadvantage my client. My client came, and it was actually a young white kid I was representing. Um, <laughs> and we did this hearing, but afterward I was thinking, what is it when this judge saw a middle-aged black man? It didn't even occur to him that's the lawyer. What that is is this narrative of racial difference, and it undermines our ability to be free, to do justice. If you go to South Africa, they will make you hear about the history of apartheid. If you go to Rwanda, they will make you understand the damage done by the genocide. If you go to Berlin, Germany today, you can't go 100 meters without seeing a marker or a stone that was placed next to the home of a Jewish family during the Holocaust. The Germans want you to go to the Holocaust Memorial. But in this country, we don't talk about the genocide. We don't talk about slavery. We don't talk about lynching. We don't talk about segregation. And we're not going to get where we need to go until we talk about it. And changing the narrative, I believe, is essential if we're going to actually be that institution that pushes us toward justice. But that's not going to be enough. Proximity is a key. Changing the narrative is key. But the third thing I am persuaded that we have to do, we have to stay hopeful. I get worried when I meet hopeless lawyers. I get worried when people tell me that they can't do anything. Our hope is critical to our ability to actually be vigilant protectors of the rule of law. Because I am persuaded that hopelessness is the enemy of justice. 
I believe injustice prevails where hopelessness persists and you've got to stay hopeful about what you can achieve. And I understand it's hard. A lot of things going on that can break down your capacity to stay hopeful, but please know that hope is the thing that gets you to figure out those complex problems. Hope is what gets you to stand up when other people say sit down. It's hope that will get you to speak when other people say be quiet. I can't tell you what makes you hopeless. I'll tell you a little bit about what makes me hopeless. I live in Montgomery, Alabama. And it's probably the worst place in America for me to live. And I say that because the thing that challenges my hope dynamic almost more than anything is that I really do not like it when people start talking about the good old days of the 40s and 50s. I don't like it when we try to romanticize our past. I don't like it when we glorify things that I don't think are glorious. In my state of Alabama, Jefferson Davis's birthday is a state holiday. I don't like it. Confederate Memorial Day is a state holiday. In Alabama, we don't have Martin Luther King Day. We have Martin Luther King slash Robert E. Lee Day. Our two largest high schools in Montgomery are Robert E. Lee High and Jefferson Davis High. I don't like when I go see my friend Sam Franklin in Bur Birmingham, I've got to go past this gigantic Confederate flag. I don't like these symbols of resistance to integration. And I was going to a prison to meet a client a few years ago, and I parked my car in the prison parking lot, and there was a truck in the lot, and the truck was like a shrine uh, to the old South. Many of you practice in parts of the country where you see these kinds of trucks. This truck had the gun rack. It had about 10 Confederate flags. I don't know why you need 10 flags of anything, but it had all of these bumper stickers, and there were actually bumper stickers on this truck I'd never seen before. And I stood there and looked at the truck, and one of the bumper stickers read, quote, if I'd known it was going to be like this, I'd have picked my own cotton. I hadn't seen that one before. And I was provoked by this truck, and I went to the door to go into the prison, and there was a white guard there. And as soon as I explained to him, I said, hi, my name is Brian Stevenson. I'm here for a legal visit. The guard said, you're not a lawyer. I said, oh, yes, sir, I am. I've been to this prison before. He said, I don't believe you're a lawyer. Where's your bar card? I said, I've never needed to show my bar card to get into this prison. He said, well, I'm not letting you in here unless you have a bar card. So I had to go back to my car and get my bar card. I came back. I showed it to the man. I said, look, I want to go into the prison. I was a little insulted. I said, I want to see my client now. And the man said, well, you've got a bar card, but I'm still going to make you get in that bathroom. I'm not letting you in until I give you a strip search. I said, no, sir, lawyers don't get strip search coming into this prison. He said, well, you're not coming into my prison unless you get in that bathroom. And I couldn't get anybody to help. I couldn't get anybody to intervene. And so I made the difficult choice of going into the bathroom and subjecting myself to this humiliating strip search. I came back out. I said, look, I want to see my client. I was trying to recover some dignity. And the man said, well, you've got to go back there and sign the book. I said, lawyers don't have to sign that book. He said, you're not coming in unless you sign that book. So I did. And finally, the man took me over to the door, and I was trying to just get out of the room with him and to the visitation space. And as I walked by him, he grabbed me by the arm. He said, hey, hey, let me ask you something. I said, what's that? He said, did you see that truck out there with all of those bumper stickers and flags? I said, yeah, I saw that truck. He said, I want you to know that's my truck. Provoked me. I was in the visitation room angry, waiting for my client. My client was a young African-American man I'd never met before. And the client came into the room finally, and he sat down. And the first thing the client said to me was, quote, did you bring me a chocolate milkshake? And I thought to myself, this is the strangest day I've had in a really long time. I said, no, I didn't bring you a chocolate milkshake. I'm your lawyer. I'm here to represent you. And I started asking my questions. And then I realized he wasn't paying attention. So I put my pen down. I said, look, man, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you wanted me to bring you a chocolate milkshake. The next time I come, if they let me, I'll bring you a chocolate milkshake. And that's when this man smiled and smiled and smiled. And I realized he was severely disabled. It turned out that he had been uh, developed symptoms of bipolar disorder at the age of 13. He was actually in 29 foster homes by the time he was 10. Uh, when he couldn't get medical care at 13, he began using crack cocaine. At 15, he began using heroin. At 16, he had uh, evidence of schizophrenia. At 17, he was homeless. At 18, he began having psychotic episodes. At 19, in the midst of a psychotic episode, a man walked by him while he was sitting on the street. This client thought the man was a demon come to destroy him. It was just a man walking by, but he stabbed that man to death. He was arrested, charged with capital murder, uh, quickly convicted of, 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 of a capital murder and sentenced to death. The trial lasted a day and a half. 
When I got the record, I read through the record, I couldn't find the words mental health, mental disease, mental disability anywhere in that record. He was terribly defended and we still have too many places in this country where our criminal justice system treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. Wealth is still the determining factor. And so we got involved and we tried to present a new case for this man. We wanted to overturn his conviction. We wanted to uh, persuade the courts that he should not be executed. And I couldn't agree more with Judy that there's a need, an urgent need for us to address this issue. The question of the death penalty in this country cannot be decided by asking whether people deserve to die. We've got to first ask the question, do we deserve to kill? And when you have a system that doesn't treat the poor fairly, when you have a system that's been compromised by politics and bias and all of these arbitrary factors, I don't think we do. And so we started working on the case. And months later had a great expert list put together and witnesses to call. And we went to the courthouse to defend this man and I was uh, really worried. And I, I sat down with my client, I said, look, you know, I, I wasn't able to get you a chocolate milkshake, I was never able to do that, but I need you to pay attention. And he said, I'll try. And I turned around and who did I see in the courtroom but that guard who treated me so badly, hadn't seen him since, but he was the guard who had brought the man from the prison to the courthouse. Well, we put on our evidence, the judge was paying attention, I was getting hopeful. The judge seemed to be engaged in the witnesses and the arguments we were making. And after three days, I was very, very hopeful we might get some relief. About a month later, I went back to the prison to see my client. I parked my car and I was walking inside and lo and behold, what do I see in the prison parking lot? That truck. And I was having one of those days where I just didn't think I could put up with a lot of foolishness. So I actually decided to come back another day, even though I'd driven two hours. And I turned around to walk back to my car and that's when I started hearing that song we used to sing in my community. They used to sing this song, can't let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. And I realized I wasn't supposed to turn around. So I got my bar card, I said, I'm gonna go deal with this guy. And sure enough, he was at the door and I went up to him and I said, hi, my name is Brian Stevenson, I'm here for a legal visit. And the man cut me off. He said, hello, Mr. Stevenson, how are you? I said, I'm fine, here's my bar card. He said, I don't need to see that. I said, well, thank you. I'll get in the bathroom for your search. He said, oh, we're not going to do that today. I said, thank you. I said, I'll go back here and sign the book. He said, Mr. Stevenson, I saw you coming and I signed you in. I said, thank you. He said, yes, sir. And he turned around to take me to the visitation door and I was walking behind him. And truth be told, I was kind of walking on my tiptoes because I knew something bad was really about to happen. <laughs> and when we got over in front of the door, I watched this man reach into his pocket and he pulled out his keys to unlock the door, but all of a sudden his hands started shaking so badly he could not get the key in the lock. And I was staring at him, figuring out what is going on here. And finally he got his hand steady enough to put the key in the lock and he unlocked the door. And when he turned around, his face was bright red. And he said, Mr. Stevenson, Mr. Stevenson, there's something I have to say to you. I said, what's that? He said, well, I want you to know I was in that courtroom when you did that hearing and I was listening. He said, I want to tell you something. He said, I want you to know I came up in the foster care system too. He said, I didn't think anybody had it as bad as I did. But listening, I realized that maybe your client had it worse than I did. And then he said, Mr. Stevenson, I'm glad you're here. There's something I want to say to you. And then this man looked at me. He said, Mr. Stevenson, I hope you keep fighting for justice. He said, I hope you keep fighting for justice. He said, Mr. Stevenson, I hope you keep doing what you're doing. I stepped back and I said, I can't tell you what this means to me, thank you. He said, no sir, I hope you keep fighting for justice. He said, I think what you're doing is a good thing. And then he put his hand out and said, sir, can I please shake your hand? Would have never, ever thought it possible. Would have never predicted it. I shook his hand and I said, thank you. And I turned to go into the prison visitation room and the man grabbed me by the arm. He said, wait, 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 I gotta tell you something else. I said, what's that? He said, well, I just want you to know I did something after the hearing with your client. I said, what'd you do? He said, well, on the way back from the courthouse to the prison, I decided to take an exit, and I took your client to a Wendy's, and I bought him a chocolate milkshake. <laughs> it's a really silly story, but I say it to you because I believe we've got to be people who are willing to stay hopeful when other people say, no, this person is beyond redemption. This person is beyond the rule of law. This person is beyond justice. These people don't deserve protection. These people don't deserve the rule of law. We've got to have enough hope to say no. We fundamentally stand for the rule of law for everyone. Proximity and changing the narrative and staying hopeful will get us a long way, but the fourth and final thing I think we have to do, if we truly want to be guardians of an institution that is committed, rooted in fairness and justice and equality, rooted in the rule of law, we've got to be willing 
to do uncomfortable things. I wish I could tell you that we could be guardians of justice and never have to do things that are inconvenient or uncomfortable, but it doesn't work like that. I haven't found any examples, and I've looked. I've looked for some examples where people uh, prevailed, where oppression was overcome, where justice prevailed, where equality triumphed, and no one had to do anything inconvenient or uncomfortable. It doesn't work like that. It only happens when good people are prepared to make difficult decisions. And because we're human, we have to make a decision to do the uncomfortable. And don't get me wrong, I'm not speaking against comfort. That's not my point. I gave a talk down in Mississippi. The people met me at the airport and they said, oh, Mr. Stevenson, we know all about you. We know what kind of person you are. We know what kind of work you do. And we have to tell you that we're having our conference at the luxurious Double Tree Hotel. And we decided that you wouldn't want to stay at the luxurious Double Tree Hotel. So we've asked one of the farmers to put you up at the barn. I said, what is wrong with you? I said, of course I want to stay in the luxurious Double Tree Hotel. I like those chocolate chip cookies just like everybody else. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is positioning yourself sometimes in difficult places. I was giving a talk in a church some years ago, and an older man came into the church. He was in a wheelchair. He was sitting in the back just staring at me. And I couldn't figure out why he was staring at me like that, but he was just in the back staring. He looked angry, had this stern look on his face. And I got through my talk, and people came up. They were very nice and appropriate, but that older man was still sitting in the back. And when everybody else left, he got a young person to wheel him to the front of the church, and he came down the center aisle of that church with this stern, angry look on his face. And when he got in front of me, he put his hand up. He said, do you know what you're doing? And I stood there, and I just looked at him. And then he asked me, he said, do you know what you're doing? And I stepped back, and I mumbled something. And then he asked me again. He said, do you know what you're doing? And then that man looked at me, and he said, I'm going to tell you what you're doing. And this man looked at me and he said, you're beating the drum for justice. You keep beating the drum for justice. And I was so moved. I was also really relieved because I just didn't know what was about to happen. <laughs> then that man grabbed me by my jacket and he pulled me into his wheelchair. He said, come here, come here. I'm going to show you something. And I watched this man turn his head. He said, do you see the scar I have behind my right ear? He said, I got that scar in Greene County, Alabama, 1963, trying to register people to vote. He turned his head. He said, you see this cut? He said, I got that cut in Philadelphia, Mississippi, 1964, trying to register people to vote. He turned his head. He said, do you see this dark spot? He said, that's my bruise. Got my bruise in Birmingham, Alabama, 1965, trying to register people to vote. He said, I'm going to tell you something, young man. He said, people look at me. They think I'm some old man sitting in a wheelchair covered with cuts and bruises and scars. He said, but I'm going to tell you, these aren't my cuts. They're not my bruises. He said, these are not my scars. He said, these are my medals of honor. I am persuaded that we can and must create a force moving toward justice on behalf of everyone. I believe really simple things. I believe each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. I think if someone tells a lie, they're not just a liar. I think even if someone kills someone, they're not just a killer. And justice requires we know the other things they are. I am persuaded that in this country, the opposite of poverty is not wealth. I believe the opposite of poverty is justice. And when we do justice, we deconstruct the conditions that give rise to inequality. And finally, I believe that our commitment to the rule of law, our character as guardians and custodians of the rule of law cannot be judged looking at how we treat the rich and the powerful and the privileged. We will be judged on how we treat the poor, the disfavored, and the incarcerated. I am so honored to be with this community. I'm so proud to celebrate this moment with you. I hope you'll get proximate. I hope you'll change narratives. I hope you'll stay hopeful. I hope you'll do uncomfortable things. I know we can advance justice for people who desperately need it. And I want to thank you for this wonderful privilege to speak to you. I wish you all the best. Thank you. I know that when you, uh, when you listen to and you hear a conversation or a talk like that, all kinds of thoughts pop into your mind about your culture and about your heritage and about your politics and about your ideologies. But the Old Testament prophet Micah in chapter 6 of his namesake book, verse 8, the scripture says this, This is what the Lord requires of you. Not what your politics require of you, not what your position requires of you, not what your race requires of you. This is what the Lord requires of you, to live justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I'm convinced 
that God is calling on his children. God is calling on his church. God is calling on you and calling on me to begin speaking into the narrative of this conversation that's currently taking place in our culture and beat that drum that we believe in justice, that we stand for and fight for mercy, and that we walk humbly no matter our position, no matter where we've come from. And the question is asked, how do you do that? I think number one, you get proximate personally and corporately. And I'm thankful that we're moving into a season where we are getting proximate corporately. I think number two, you change the narrative. You begin removing yourselves from narratives that propitiate this line of thinking. And you begin to intentionally change the narrative of the conversation. Number three, you stay hopeful. That change is around the corner. So often we can look at the world and say, well, it's just too broken. It's just too far gone. This is just the world we live in. You need to hear me say and remember that this pastor said back in 2017, I do not look at this world and say, this is just the world we live in. I want to leave my world in better hands for my children than I found it when I was born. And number four. We've got to be willing to do uncomfortable things, have uncomfortable conversations. you got to know, I'm a pastor in Charlotte, North Carolina, in the deep south. It can't get much more uncomfortable for me than playing this video for you today. Not because I don't believe in you, but because the reality is I know assumptions will be made off of it. But until we begin to do uncomfortable things, we won't begin seeing a difference made in the culture and in the lives of those people that we live with and serve among. So maybe this is for you personally, maybe this is just for us corporately, but collectively together, my heart and my hope and my prayer is that Micah 6-8 becomes the reality of our hearts. God, thanks for challenging us, for intentionally prodding us where we need to be prodded. God, we ask that as we leave this place and as we walk out of this place today, that we would be people who stand for justice, simultaneously people who love your mercy, but in all things, people who walk humbly. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray.